We're good. All right. Welcome everyone to Haley's Senior Project. I'm Mrs. Hunter. I'm her Senior Project Advisor and the Excel teacher at the high school. Um, just to give you an idea of how things are going to run today, Haley is going to present her Senior Project, after which uh, there will be a time for questions. Uh, we'll ask questions from the panel first, and then in the, in the interest of time, if there is time, we'll open it up to questions from the rest of uh, the audience. Um, Haley is going for Distinguished today, so keep that in mind, panel members, when you are um, taking notes and filling out the rubric. After the Q&A, we'll have the audience members and Haley leave the room, and then panel will deliberate. So uh, we'll use the rubric in front of you to do that. You don't have to fill anything out as she's presenting, so you can kind of just sit back, relax, take notes, and then after she presents during our deliberation, we'll go down through the rubric together. Uh, you also have a couple more forms in front of you. You have a warm and cool feedback form. So you can use this as she's presenting to take notes if you like. I kind of draw a line down the center and I use one half to take notes and then I use the other half for warm and cool feedback. That's completely up to you. You can use the back of the paper as well. Um, we will be giving Haley our warm and cool feedback at the end. Uh, and I know I can never remember enough to, um, without writing it down. Uh, and then also you have her senior project proposal in front of you as well. So um, if you get a chance to read that between now and when we deliberate, or you can read it as we deliberate, um, sh what she does in her presentation has got to match what she set out to do at the beginning of the semester in her proposal. Okay. Um, once we determine the grade that she gets, uh, we'll bring Haley and any audience members that she wants to come back into the room, and we'll let her know how she did and give her her warm and cool feedback. Before we start, take a moment and um, silence your cell phones if you <coughs> haven't already done so, which that's always my reminder to myself as well. Okay, I think we're, as soon as I sit down, <laughs> we can get started. I'm sorry, it's a little dark. Okay, I think we're good. So my name is Haley Bowden and welcome to my senior project. I'd like to thank my panel members, Ms. Hunter, Mr. Dugan, Ms. Eldridge, and Carrie Fleming for coming today. And I would like to also introduce my expert, Mrs. Gisela Heidenreich, who could not be here today because she is in Germany. <laughs> but um, for my essential question, I'll be answering what are the psychological effects on children that were a part of the Leave Inform program? So this seems like a pretty odd topic, and a lot of people have never heard of the Leave Inform program. But my inspiration came from eighth grade social studies with Mr. Dukin, where I learned a lot about the Holocaust, <coughs> and it really sparked my interest and um, encouraged me to read a lot of books and find a lot of documentaries that had to do with the Holocaust. And while I was roaming through some documentaries, I found this one called The Last Nazis, Three Children of the Master Race. <coughs> and in it, it told the story of three Liebensborn children, Gisela Heidenreich, my expert, as well as Gunter Faber and um, Volker Heineck, who you'll hear about later on. And um, I was just really appalled by this documentary and by their stories, and it was hard to believe that it was true. So I did more research, and after doing more research and finding out how big it was, that's what made me want to do my senior project on it. So as I mentioned before, I already knew quite a bit about the Holocaust from eighth grade social studies. I knew about the millions of Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, and countless others that were persecuted and often executed in the Holocaust, all under the reign of um, Adolf Hitler, as with the help of his assistants, such as um, Heinrich Kimmler, who was the head of the SS, and also the medical experimentations done by Dr. Joseph Mengele. So in order to answer my essential question, I have to address a number of points so that you fully or grasp the concept of Liebensborn. So in order to do that, I will address German and American eugenics, the formation of Liebensborn, what is Liebensborn, the psychological effects, the Nuremberg trials, and the Liebensborn children now. So to start off with, it's essential that you understand um, eugenics before I really start talking about anything else. So the definition of eugenics is the science of improving a human population by controlled breeding to increase the occurrence, the occurrence of desirable heritable characteristics. 
So at this time in history, there wasn't really a way to manipulate biology so that they could actually create the master race. So instead they used things like sterilization and marriage laws to control the breeding so that really only the pure would be born. So that was their plan. And um, so as I mentioned, it was German and American eugenics. So they really supported each other and that support came about during the Weimar Republic, which was during 1919 to 1933. The Weimar Republic was a very progressive era in German history. It was progressive in terms of welfare, insurance, um, as well as innovative health treatment. And that's what drew Americans to um, the Weimar Republic. So a lot of American doctors would go to the Weimar Republic, which was Germany, and go to German universities to learn about medicine. And when they came back to America and went to universities such as Harvard or John Hopkins, they were considered to be more accredited because they had studied in Germany. But the downfall of the Weimar Republic came about in 1929 when the world economic crisis happened and that's when Hitler started to make his rise and um, the Weimar Republic began to fall. But at this time, American eugenics was making bigger strides and eventually, in a way, they connected to build Germany back up. So at this time and a little bit before, American eugenics was making strides with Charles Davenport and Harry Laughlin. Charles Davenport um, was appointed director of the Cold Springs Harbor Laboratory in 1904, and in 1910, he made it the eugenics records office and appointed Harry Laughlin as the superintendent. Um, Charles Davenport had a PhD in biology from Harvard and Harry Laughlin had a PhD in psychology which is the study, the study of molecular biology from Princeton. So together they became kind of household, household names in the eugenics movement. So the eugenics movement sparked a number of controversial arguments such as Buck versus Bell, which was in 1927. So Buck versus Bell was a Supreme Court case, which um, was a big stepping stone for the eugenics movement. It, <coughs> um, it was a question of the constitutionality of a Virginia state law that um, said that sterilization was legal. And a woman, Carrie Buck, brought this to the Supreme Court after bringing it through the Virginia State Supreme Court and working its way up. Um, sh she had been allegedly raped and pronounced feeble-minded and promiscuous and sent to a home for the feeble-minded where they agreed that she was the perfect candidate for sterilization. But she argued this, but unfortunately in an eight to one decision, the Supreme Court decided that she was indeed a perfect <coughs> candidate for sterilization and that sterilization should be legal and <coughs> sorry a famous quote by Justice Oliver Wendell said it is better for all of the world if instead of waiting to execute the degenerate offspring for crime or let them start with their imbecility society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind and that quote was key in the eugenics movement because it basically made all of it okay. And it was later used in the Nuremberg trials as a justification for these atrocities that happened there as well. So um, the eugenics movement made um, strides in Buck versus Bell, but also California really cultivated it. Over half of the sterilization that happened in the United States happened in California alone. And this may be a lot because of a exhibit called the New Germany, which was displayed in Pasadena, California. And it again connected Germany and American medicine. So they were drawing inspiration from each other. And America kind of thought, well, they're beating us at our own game. So we have to contribute to the eugenics movement. And a lot of philanthropists did this, such as John D. Rockefeller. So by 1926, John D. Rockefeller had contributed over 450,000 to 
eugenics programs in Germany, which would be about $4 million in 21st century currency. Um, he also financially supported programs who employed Dr. Joseph Mengele, as I mentioned, who was one of the infamous doctors at Auschwitz, as well as Ernst Rudin. He gave $250,000 to the Kaiser Wilhelm Associates Psychiatric Association, where Ernst Rudin was the director, and Ernst Rudin later became one of the main people in the medical repression that happened during the Holocaust. So all of these contributions to Germany's eugenics, as well as American eugenics, gave it the ability to be a popular idea. So popular that 27 states had enforced sterilization laws, and over 60,000 people were forcefully sterilized in the United States. Um, this movie is um, one of the movies that was supposed to be an informational movie to the citizens so that they could understand what exactly sterilization was and how it could affect them. this shows so far in history most as I mentioned that <coughs> eugenics mainly revolved around sterilization before although America did have some marriage restrictions set in place Germany took it a step further by implementing Rusha which is Rasse und Siedlungsschampfuchse der SS and it translates to safeguarding the racial purity of the SS which the SS is the Schussenstrafel, and it is the <coughs> um, basically the elite of the elite and the, the elite of the elite in the Nazi, um, the National Socialist Party. Um, so, the Rusha dealt with safeguarding the racial purity of the SS, as I mentioned. Um, they dealt with the classification of people of German descent, so deciding whether they should be sent to concentration camps or whether they should be kept and raised up in Nazi ideology. And um, they dealt with the selection of enemies for labor or Germanization, which is very similar to the first thing. And also the kidnapping of children, which also all fa falls under Liebensborn. So also I'd just like to mention that Hitler didn't assume power until after Russia was implemented, but because of the downfall of the Weimar Republic, he was able to gain that authority. But 
So all of these things um, fell under Lieben's board. So through the implementation of Rusha, Himmler was able to create Lieben's born. So Lieben's born is the fountain, it translates to the fountain of life or the spring of life. And it was a program aimed at raising Germany's birth rates and population of Aryan people. This was after World War I. Um, the German population had kind of gone into a decline because um, fathers of children were away at war and mothers didn't want to have children with no fathers, so they began getting abortions. So the abortions in Germany started skyrocketing, and so they had to come up with a way to raise the birth rate back up and raise the next master. So a lot of people would wonder why so many mothers came to these homes to have their children, and why have the children with no fathers in general. But <coughs> um, this quote by George Lilienthal, I believe, describes it all. It says, Himmler wished to found a new morality based on right, racial ideology, which made it a duty of producing children. So these mothers believed that it was their moral duty to the motherland to have these Aryan children and that these children would grow up to be the next Nazi elite, so they were contributing to their country. Um, so, just to show you how big it really is, there was 50,000 children kidnapped into Liebensborn, there was um, 8,000 children born in Germany, and 12,000 born in Norway. And so these numbers really, again, show how big Liebensborn really was. And it's really important to show how it all began. So it began in 1935. Heinrich Himmler um, founded it through Rusia. And there was nine homes in Germany, 10 homes in Norway, as well as others scattered throughout Austria, Poland, Denmark, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg. And Hitler claimed it was a welfare um, program in which mothers could have their children in secrecy away from the public because they were having illegitimate children, which brings me to the fact that 60% of the mothers in Liebensborn were unmarried, and a majority were of Nordic descent. Now this is because um, in order to have children here, if they didn't just let any mothers in, you had to pass a purity test, which only 40% of applicants passed. And through that purity test, they had to have blonde hair, blue eyes, a lot of measurements were taken, and um, they had to trace their ancestry back at least three generations to show that they weren't of non-pure blood. So when they had these children, they could either leave them in the Liebensborn's homes or they could raise them themselves in a sort of national socialist sense, meaning that they grew up learning Nazi ideology. But if the children were kidnapped, they not only had to grow up learning Nazi ideology, but they also had to be Germanized which means that they were not allowed to speak their native language, and they had to be given new German names and become completely Germanized. So along with this, as I mentioned, all of the children grew up learning Nazi ideology, Nazi education. They were basically part of Hitler Youth. And also, um, I'd like to mention that they were also given SS baptisms, which isn't a traditional christening or baptism. It's shown in this picture right over here. And it's a ceremony in which an SS dagger is held above the baby. And while that is happening, the mother or guardian or one of the nurses would pledge their allegiance to Hitler over the child. So now with the majority of what Liebensborn is and the history of it and knowledge, you could see how there would be a number of repercussions of the kidnapping and thousands of illegitimate children that were Germanized with no fathers. So these repercussions are disruption of the familial collective, which um, um, the disruption of the familial collective was a problem throughout Europe in the time, not only with Liebensborn, but specifically with Liebensborn because Many of them were illegitimate children, many of them were kidnapped, and very few got to, to make it back home to their original families. So Howard Kirscher, who was a longtime child advocate during the war, said in 1940, one of the greatest tragedies of all time is the separation of families in Europe today. Wives in one country, husbands in another, with no possibility of reunion, and often no means of communication. Babies who have never 
seen their fathers scattered fragments of families, not knowing if their loved ones are living or dead, often without any hope of ever seeing them again. <clears throat> so that just gives you an idea of what was going on in Europe at the time and what was going on with the leave in foreign children. And this has obviously had a impact on their lives and um, a lot of United Nations officials agree, as well as Benita A. Lewis, who's an officer with the International Refugee Organization in Germany. She said that the lost identity of uh, individual children is the social problem of the day in the continent of Europe, and even if his future destiny lies within a country other than that of his origin, he, the displaced child, is entitled to the basic human rights of full knowledge of his background and origin. So, um, this idea that they were taken from their home and displaced had a major effect on the children throughout their lives. Also, um, on this same note, German hatred was rampant throughout Europe after the war because of all of the things that happened. They blamed the Germans, even the innocent ones, such as the children. So, um, Thorley Flat, who is one of the, he's the president of the Association of Liebensborn Poor Children in Norway, and he said that it's difficult to comprehend the extent of abuse that took place in the orphanages and foster homes. The Norwegian authorities considered the little krauts, which is what they called them, as inferior and as a possible future fifth column. So what that means is that they believed that they once again would rise up and start this Nazi movement all over again, which was completely unrealistic consider considering they were all just children and they really didn't know their past or that their families were Nazis. So um, they face a, a variety of persecution throughout their lives, as well as their mothers did as well, because often their mothers couldn't get jobs and yeah, their mothers couldn't get jobs, and so they were never really able to provide for them. The children eventually became sort of a nuisance. So in order to fully comprehend the repercussions of Liebensborn um, that these children had to face, it's important to hear their individual stories so you can begin to get an idea of it. So to start off with, Thorley Flat, who I mentioned was the president of the Association of Liebensborn War Children, he's shown right down here. His story is that he was born in a Liebensborn home, and when he was nine or ten, he was taken out of the Liebensborn home and brought back to Germany with his mother. But on the trip there, he was not allowed to speak his native language because of all the German hate. So she didn't want people to find out that he was German, so for a year he could not speak at all because he couldn't speak German. He, well, he could only speak German. And um, then when they finally got there, his mother fell in love with a Norwegian man who had a strong prejudice against the Germans and said that if they didn't get rid of this little Kraut, then he wouldn't marry her and the mother refused to be at the wedding. So she decided to put Thorley Flap up for adoption when he was 10 years old and had to explain right in front of him why she no longer wanted him and that he was a nuisance. Um, another story is Paul Hansen. He was born in a Liebensborn home and when he was five years old, he was taken into care by the Oslo authorities. And um, a perfectly healthy five-year-old boy was sent to the Emma Hajork Psychiatric Hospital and declared mentally retarded, along with a number of other Liebensborn children, just because they were Liebensborn children and there was so much German hatred. Um, this right here is Volker Heineck, who was previously Alexander Lithiau before he was kidnapped from Crimea when he was two years old. He grew up in a wealthy German family, so he lived a more privileged life and didn't find out until he was much older that anything about his past, he, that he had been adopted or that he had been kidnapped. And this over here is Guntram Weber with, um, he was Himmler's godson. So this is the thing that I find most um, interesting about him. He has the story of most Liebensborn children his mother gave birth to him, raised him by herself, but the interesting part is that Himmler took a liking to him and made him his godson. So, one other Liebensborn story that I got to hear about in more depth was Gisela Heidenreichs. 
So after an extensive amount of research and looking for Lieben's born children just about everywhere, I um, looked up her name and found her author website, and eventually found her email, and after like a bunch of emails, I finally got a response back from her and we spoke a little bit about her experience and um, how she's contributing today. So she does a lot of speeches with the United Nations and a, a number of seminars and lectures that um, help people understand Lieben's born. But her story is that she, her mother was an SS secretary. She was born in Oslo, Lieben's born home in 1943. Her mother, um, decided to bring her to her sister, so her aunt. And she grew up thinking that her aunt was her mother and her mother was her aunt until she was a couple years old and her, whom she thought was her father came home and she was so excited to see him and he said, what is this SS bastard doing in my home? And so that's when she started to uncover the truth. She started to grow back a connection with her biological mother but it still wasn't until she was 18 years old that she found out who her real father was and eventually built up back up a relationship with him. But after hearing all of these stories of all of these children, you could begin to see what type of hardship these children face and um, you can begin to imagine the psychological impacts that this all had on them. So um, this is just a summary of what some of it may be. They felt the shame of being illegitimate, um, the guilt of carrying the National Socialist Party on their back. They were considered Nazis. The isolation for not really knowing their past, not knowing their stories, and some of them not even having families. They often felt lied to because they their lives were kept a secret for so long, often to protect them, but they were still lied to, and also being used. They were sort of part of a science experiment where they, they were supposed to be the next master race and they were being used as the next master race. Some of the quotes that I feel like really explain this is one over here by Giselle Nianjo, who was born in Wagamont, Liebens born in 1943. She said, we're not responsible, we're the victims, but since the war people have been prejudiced against Liebens born children, I was ashamed. You never imagine you could be part of a project and it's difficult to comprehend. This sort of has to do with the being lied to. Um, he says, I spent 60 years of my life in the dark. This may be why I am the way I am. I'm a pretty closed off person and it has certainly affected me and I spent many of my years not knowing, many years of my life not knowing where I came from. And then this is the guilt and she, Giselle Heinrich explains how she felt a lot of guilt, but she also felt victimized as Giselle Leandro said, but she, recalls her childhood as associatively I remember my childhood in post-war Bavaria that was sometimes pleasant but constantly overshadowed by uncertainty, by secretiveness and lack of honesty by my unusual birthplace and the shame of being illegitimate. So as I mentioned, the number of things that happened to them throughout their lives, a majority of them tend to feel these emotions and are psychologically affected in this way. So after hearing all that these children went through in their lives and the psychological strife that they faced, you would think that there would be consequences for those that were in charge of the Liebensborn program. But in fact, Liebensborn was the only SS organization to be acquitted at Nuremberg. So um, it went from October 1947 to March of 1948. It was known as the Rusha trial. <laughs> and it was the trials of war criminals before the Nuremberg military tribunals. There was four members of the Liebensborn that were charged with war crimes against and crimes against humanity. These were program director, Mac, Colonel Max Solman, deputy director, Inga Wehrmacht, medical director, Gregor Ebner, Ebner and head of the legal department, Gunther Tesch. And um, they, were not charged with anything associated with Liebensborn. They were only charged with SS crimes. So the, the explanation for this was done by one of the Nuremberg judges, and he said, it is quite clear from evidence that the Liebensborn Association, which existed long before the war, was a welfare institution and primarily a maternity home. 
and that of the numerous organizations operating in Germany who were connected with foreign children brought, up, brought to Germany, Lebensform was an organization which did everything in its power to provide for the children and protect the legal interests of the children in its care. So this was basically exactly what Himmler wanted. He wanted everyone to believe it was a welfare institution and that they were only doing good for the children and mothers. But as you can see through the story, this wasn't completely accurate. So years later, the same thing happened yet again. In 2008, at the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, the war children, which are what Liebensborn called, children are called in Norway, um, sued the Norwegian government for decades of discrimination, as well as the failure to protect them from this persecution and discrimination. But yet again, Norway was not held liable for the persecution of the Liebensborn children, like the, the persecution that the Liebensborn children had experienced over the past 60 years, and not liable for their failure to protect the children. So despite all of the obstacles that these children face, and even face now in efforts for their justice, these children have been trying to get their stories out for years, and in, in order to prevent these atrocities from happening again, which has somewhat made, they've somewhat made strides in this field. So in 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights did indeed make in provisions that um, protected the familial collective, which was disrupted during Liebensborn. In Article 16, they said, the family is the natural and fundamental group unit of society and is entitled to protection by society and state. So that was one step towards preventing these atrocities from happening again. But it, um, it was hard to really get their stories out because all of the documentation was burned in Berlin right after the war and the few remaining documents were taken by the American Red Cross and were held with them. So it wasn't until the 1980s that Liebensborn children really started to come out with their stories. They began publishing autobiographies and the first documentary was aired in Germany in the 1980s. <laughs> in 2001, Traces of Life was established, which is a support group for Liebensborn children. There's over 150 Liebensborn children in the group, as well as a number of family psychiatrists and others that are interested in learning about um, the Liebensborn program. In 2002, the Norwegian government began to compensate, and I say slightly because they did compensation based on discrimination. So instead of compensating them all the same amount or the amount that some say they would deserve, they gave them a little bit of money based on the prejudice that they faced throughout their life, which is a little bit odd. And in 2008, the European court brought more public attention to Liebensborn. And one quote that I feel really sums up what Liebensborn is doing, the Liebensborn children are doing now is by my expert, Giselle Heidenreich. She said, children who are elected to live and not selected to die are responsible for the reconciliation with those nations who were enemies before, and we are obliged to, in helping to prevent those atrocities in the future. So back to my central question. It is what are the psychological effects on children that were part of the Liebensborn program? And I would say the best summary of this would be, although it was unsuccessful in creating the master race, the children that were kidnapped or brought into the program to this day still feel the residual effects of their displacement and Germanization. And those feelings include victimization, isolation, loss of identity, as well as all the other ones that I have mentioned. And I don't so much have a connection to my post-secondary plans as much as I do a connection to today. So the purpose of learning history is so that we don't repeat our mistakes of the past. And I feel like that is sort of what we're doing now. So we've, um, right now with the current events such as the Syrian refugee crisis, um, we are kind of having a lot of conflict with that, whether we should let them in or not. And I thought it was important to show these graphs. Um, so it says it has been proposed to bring into this country 10,000 refugee children from Germany, most of them Jewish, and take care of them in American homes and should the government permit this to happen. And 61, per, I believe that's 60% of Americans said, no, we should not let them in. Now these are children, but the fact that they said that they were Jewish 
and the amount of an, um, the anti-Semity in the time um, made it so that they didn't want that to happen. And also, what is your attitudes towards allowing German, Austrian, and other political refugees into coming into the United States? And 67.4, I believe, said that they did not want them to come to the United States. Now, in comparison to a modern day survey, this says, which of the following do you think is the best approach for the US to take the refugees fleeing from the civil war in Syria? 53% um, said that we should not take them. So this was on the eve of the Holocaust, basically. And this is now. So I just think that it's important to remember what's happened in the past and in order to, again, prevent these atrocities from happening. Um, my expert said when it, at a United Nations conference, um, she said, when again xenophobia grows in these days against thousands of desperate refugees arriving in Europe, when hatred outrages in burning hostels for asylum, risking their harm or death, then we, the last eyewitnesses, are not allowed to cease from remembering the crimes of the National Socialist Regime, which I think basically sums up my connection to today. So, in conclusion, thank you all for coming to my senior project, as the Germans would say, Danke und auf Wiedersehen. <laughs> and um, so again, thank you all for coming. not only like socially supported them and said wow why aren't we having these eugenics policies that Germany is getting but also American philanthropists financially supporting them and I wish I could remember the exact like the exact quote but I one quote was an American journalist saying that they're beating us at our own game so I wish I could remember the exact one but it was something along those lines so I feel like people at the time were proud of supporting this, and I can't say that we directly contributed to Lieben's form, but we did help it. So th this is probably a weird question, but do you think if any of these guys, uh, if they won, if the Nazis won, if Germany wins, would any of these kids feel any shame, guilt, or would they just be like, this is great? Yeah. Well, I think that Okay, this is going to sound kind of weird, but I don't think that all of the Nazis were completely guilty. They were guilty of what they did, of sticking to it, but I don't think that they all wholeheartedly supported what they were doing and that a lot of them did feel the shame and guilt of what they were doing, but had to stick to it just to stay alive. So, granted, a lot of the SS officers were wholehearted Nazis, but a lot of the other people, like these children would grow up to be, who may not become Nazi elite, who may just become average Nazi citizens, I think that they would feel the shame and guilt that, of what was going on around them. Why do you think that, um, like one of them hasn't written a book or done something to like really publicize their cause? Well, a lot of them have, they just don't publish them in 
such. So one example is my expert. She sent me her abstract to her biography, but it, none of her books have been published in English. And she said that's the case with a lot of um, Liebensborn children. A lot of the Liebensborn books in English are fictional and they're not completely accurate. So their biographies are mainly published in Norwegian and German. <laughs> okay. Any other questions from the panel here? Um, I have one. Yeah. Um, in your comparison to like then and now, um, the refugees from Germany were like children, and the refugees from Syria are like of all ages. And do you think that that might affect the polling in any way? Um, I think that it might, but at the same time, there was actually more people willing to have the refugees. Syrian refugees in America now than there was um, then, if you notice, it was 60% from 1939, and it was 53% saying no. 60% were saying no then, 53% were saying no now. I don't think it's so much as a public issue of whether they're children or not as much as it is religion. And that's why I think so many people said no, because they mentioned that the refugee children were Jewish, and they say now that the refugees are from Syria, implying that they're Muslim, which, as just so Heidenreich mentioned, there's a lot of xenophobia nowadays. Any other questions? I, I just have a, yeah. I guess, like a personal question. So um, when I did, did your class, when I teach your class and every class, I try and do spend some time on Native American. And almost every class, I think I've taught about these schools where we did that we took Native American kids and did this almost the same thing, like yeah. to the point where they're taking rubber bands and snapping their tongues if they try to speak their language. I was just curious if you remember that. Yeah, I do. Okay. Like, I, I, that's like one of the, like there's a lot of connections that you can make to American history, right. that being one of them. I know that in cases of kidnapping, there was a woman who would kidnap middle, kid, middle class children from their homes and replace, put them in like wealthier societies that. So there's a lot of connections that you can make to American history to what's going on now. Or not now, but that. <laughs> okay. So if we're good, I think what we'll do is excuse Haley and her audience I'm members drunk. to the pod. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask her out there, I'm sure she would be willing to be with you. Hold on.